Да. Да. Вот скажи. Тиса, 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 Minimas. Ah. Mas o que eu vi é o Oi, oi, oi. Ale. Lança, lança. Lança, lança. Lança. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Hello. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Tashtale and welcome to the eighth session of our weekly virtual teachings by Venerable Geshe Lakhtar. And um, I would like to begin by saying uh, thank you to Geshe Lakhtar for continuously giving us his valuable time and also blessing us with his presence. And thanks to all of you too, uh, those of you who are here on Zoom and uh, our viewers who are catching us live on Facebook. Thank you for joining us and sharing our blessings. And I would, before we begin, I would also like to make a very special mention of the very special day today with His Holiness is launching his second uh, volume in the book series, uh, Science and Philosophy in the Indian Buddhist Classics. The book is titled The Mind. And if you want to check out the video, the recording is there available on His Holiness's website, YouTube, and Facebook. And with that, welcome Gishla, welcome everyone. And Gishla, we are ready to rejoice in your teachings. Please bless us. Thank you. <clears throat> Namaste. Can you hear? <clears throat> okay, so I will yeah. greet you today with this word Namaste. The Hindi, very popular Hindi word that we use Namaste actually is combination of I think two letters. Nama, namaha means to pay respect, uh, to pay uh, obeisance. And Namaste, te means you. So when Indians greet each other, they say Namaste and fold their hands at their heart, very sincerely. And by that they are saying, I bow down and I respect to you. So to you here means not the body, but the real person, which you can call it as a immortal soul or whatever, according to Hinduism. But basically it is saying, I bow down to you, your person, in which your actual identity and my identity, there is a lot of similarity. So I respect to you. So with this word, I bow down to the good things, uh, which is there to all of you. I think this is a very wonderful way of greeting because all of us have many, many great, excellent qualities and especially the capacity to become the best. In Buddhism, we call it Tathagata Garb which means the Buddha essence. So all of us have the Buddha essence or Buddha nature. If we are able to properly use it, we have the, all of us have the capacity to become the Buddha. So therefore it is really, really worthy of uh, paying homage and respect to each other. And you should respect not only, you know, people who said to be possessing more education or, uh, or uh, you know, uh, society, so in, in the case of the level of society, a little bit higher position than society, not, not in that case, everybody, everybody, not only human beings, but if you are a good practitioner, you should pay homage and respect to all living beings, right? All sentient beings. And I remember His Holiness the Dalai Lama once saying that in some cases, we should pay more respect to, to a tiny insect, like a earthworm, uh, than a human being in some cases. Because, uh, you know, superficially the earthworm is wriggling and really looks helpless. But if you see carefully, this earthworm is not harming anybody. The pollution that you are experiencing in Delhi is not produced by earthworm. In fact, the earthworm, even though it looks quite, <laughs> you know, weak and fragile, but uh, I, I have seen that it, it produces, you know, very fertile manure and which people are using it. So in its own way, it's contributing, not harming anybody. So likewise, many of these other seemingly helpless sentient beings, they are not only an ornament to our planet environment, but in their own way, they are contributing to the whole ecosystem. So therefore it is worthy of respecting and regarding and protecting them. And as I said earlier, that it is because of our completely ignoring, you know, other sentient beings, uh, the environment and so forth. And as a result, we are experiencing all these problems that we are seeing today. So therefore, uh, 
it is it is important to respect all other living beings and protect them and nurture them so that they become source of peace and happiness not source of pandemics okay they become source of pandemics because of our mistreating with them mishandling them so that is what i want to say right in the beginning so therefore the chapter that we are going to read uh, now the chapter 8 is basically on uh, the wealth of a superior being the wealth of arya so this is basically saying the wealth of arya is not the ordinary wealth uh, the material objects that we normally uh, long to obtain and accumulate so therefore the, the text says give up all material objects give up all material objects and adorn by the wealth of the excelled so two very important statement one give up all material wealth is not saying that you throw everything and uh, overnight become beggar that will not work so giving up here means mentally you know renouncing attachment to these objects i'll tell you a story at the time of milarepa there was a follower of milarepa who was uh, very very moved by milarepa's lifestyle and teaching then he decided that i will also act like milarepa then he suddenly threw all his possessions and belongings but he was actually not mentally prepared so then he started suffering and when he started suffering then he started complaining by saying it is this milarepa who made me a beggar so i'm not advocating that you become a beggar overnight by throwing everything because you are still an ordinary human being you need all these basic necessities at least but what i'm saying is especially when you undertake the bodhisattva practice having wealth itself is not the problem the problem is the clinging not being able to use by oneself properly not being able to share it with others but if you have this wish to share the wealth then the more you have the better it is because you can elevate the poverty of many people so therefore what he is saying here is at the end of the day the real wealth that you need is the internal wealth and not the external wealth so that's why earlier we read many lines already uh, regarding how to develop internal wealth and particularly we read a line which talks about cultivating loving kindness and compassion and establishing yourself in bodhicitta so i have explained this earlier which which basically means if you and i also cited a quotation from nagarjuna uh, where nagarjuna says if you really want to get settled or established then you must help others so you can help others by seeing this interconnected reality and thereby you know step by step developing all these inner qualities for example in the case of these three you know loving kindness and compassion and bodhicitta loving kindness means thinking how nice if all sentient beings meet with happiness now that kind of attitude you will be able to develop only when you are able to see others as something dear to your heart something close to your heart you know that that itself is a big 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 practice normally we we are very fond of uh, segregating you know white and black and men and women and this and that and short and you know tall and whatever you know we are very human mind is very fond of dividing that's why we are not able to have a holistic attitude you know so what all these great thinkers and teachers they are teaching is to have a holistic attitude Do, don't divide don't fragment everything don't destroy everything right and in the, if you, if you read some of the te- ancient teaching some of these teachers they say you know they they for example in buddhism we talk about the 10 virtues practices right in christian in christianity they talk about seven sins <clears throat> so they they talk about only seven or 10 because it is around this number that human beings will be able to grasp not not beyond that not they will not be able to remember too many things right so therefore what i'm saying is <clears throat> that loving kindness is really like if you develop just loving kindness as i said or just compassion it is just a big 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 development loving kindness as i said wishes others meet with happiness and you will develop that wish to for others happiness only if you are able to see others as something dear to you something close to you now ordinarily we feel you know somebody close to you or dear to you when that person has helped you financially 
or when that person is physically attractive, then you know we develop this superficial feeling of closeness. But as and when we see somebody harming you, or as and when you encounter somebody who is poor and miserable and ugly looking, there is no sign of our loving kindness, you see. So what, what these teachings are saying is, all sentient beings are exactly like you, wanting happiness, not wanting suffering, right? But in their own limited capacity, their way, they are all try to help others as much as they can. It may be alloyed, it may be attached, you know, with attachment and so forth, but everybody tries to even share a cup of tea or a cup of water, you know, everybody has that tendency. This is a great kind of indication that everybody has the capacity to, to do the, the best thing, to do the highest thing. So we must nurture it. So therefore, and then when we talk about cultivating loving kindness and compassion, bodhicitta, we are not talking about doing a self-sacrifice. In fact, you will be the best beneficiary if you sincerely practice this, not, not hypothetically, but uh, hypocritically, but if you, if you do this practice sincerely, wholeheartedly, you know, see others, something close to you, something important to you. As I mentioned earlier, they're important to you because you're able to practice compassion in relation to these people. The best qualities that we are talking right now, compassion, loving kindness, bodhicitta, you can develop all these wonderful inner qualities in relation to these people, not in relation to a, to a piece of iron or a, you know, a tree or a, you know, water or things like that. So it is due to this seemingly helpless, fragile sentient beings that you are able to cultivate all these inner qualities. So be thankful to them. That way also you'll be able to remember their kindness. So once you're able to see them as you know, close to your heart and able to develop this loving kindness, then the next point is that how not only you will think that they meet with happiness, then you will think how nice if uh, they, they, they are without suffering. And the next point is then you will think that it is not only thinking that they meet with happiness and uh, without suffering, but I will myself take the responsibility of making them meet with happiness and making them meet with, you know, the, uh, remove the suffering. You, so there, now it is of course easier said than done, but this does not mean to say we cannot practice. So on a very, to start with, on a very small scale, help somebody in whatever way. I'm not talking just giving money, in whatever way. There are 100,000 ways you can help. And especially during this, you know, period of pandemics and other crisis, you know, people are, people are longing to get that help. So even if you just smile, you know, and I've seen this, I've met a number of people, you know, who, who have nobody to, you know, tell their sad story, nobody to share their experience. Even if you just lend your ear and sit there and listen to them, pet them, you know, and uh, if possible, give them a cup of tea or whatever, you know, they, 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 they get inspired. They think it's not just me, you know, there are good people looking after me. And then from there comes the wish to live longer. And that contributes to their health and well being and the wish to do greater things, wish to change, wish to face crisis and all these things. But if these practices of loving kindness and compassion and bodhicitta, if these are not there, and if we try to address all the human problems just through money, then, then I don't have to elaborate this. Then we'll reach where, to some extent, we have already reached. I mean, I don't need to tell you a long story, but you know, look at the human evolution. Long, long ago, when men lived in the cave, which means no house, naked, which means no cloth, and the food, all these delicacies that we are buying from the supermarket, nothing of that sort was there. So they used to eat fruit and leaves or whatever is available. Now from that state, today, you know, we can't complain actually. You know, the, the, the rooms, your rooms may not be very big. Now we'll say my room is not big, my house is not big, but you have room. You have a house to live. And then look at the clothes, you know, if you just open your wardrobe, I mean, all kind of like, you have all kind of clothes with all kind of shape and size and color and fashion and you know, you can you you are, you will look more beautiful than a peacock, you know. <laughs> you have all this. Then then as I said, the food and so then more than that, the communication. You see today, the capacity to communicate to each other, even during this pandemic, you know, 
if you are able to share, you can talk to your people, just say hello and she is there or he is there, you know, you can talk and, you know, exchange some light subjects to make each other's mind cheerful. All these exercises, all these facilities are there. Despite of all this material, amazing, unbelievable material facilities that we have at our disposal, despite of all this, still in terms of the amount of suffering, it is still questionable whether the suffering and uh, you know, other forms of problems like depression and so forth has minimized or maximized, right? So basically the sufferings are still there because we have tried to address these internal problems just with material external development. So this is a clear indication that unless you address the inner problems, unless you reduce the negative afflictive emotions within you and within other people, the solution will never be there. So this is the crux of the matter. We need to be very, very serious. We need to be very, very serious, especially during such experience of pandemic. We must make it a commitment, make it a promise to learn something from this experience. And then for the rest of life, the post COVID experience, as they say, <laughs> again, you know, when it comes to doing something good, you know, and also experience of suffering, human memory is so short, so short. We tend to forget everything. Now make it a point to write down all the experiences during this pandemic and make it a point, a group promise or individual commitment, whatever, we make it, write down and say, we'll, we'll make the next society a different one, better one. So that kind of commitment and willing to change must be there. And it is not the first time we are experiencing this pandemic. We experienced this before also. Probably on those occasions, people made some commitment promises also, but where are they now? Nothing. Because human beings, our mind is so elusive and unless we make a special attempt, make a special commitment, make a special plan, we tend to forget. And then next time you might not only encounter another pandemic, but maybe some people say maybe more serious, unfortunately karma such bitter truth, right? So we, and we, we must take this very, very seriously and come up with some plan, you know, far reaching plan, not just, you know, restricted to one individual, but far reaching plan. We can all at least make a difference. So that, that is, I think, very, very important. So therefore in this chapter, he's really talking about not just running after the external material wealth, but instead, cultivating these inner qualities, which will be mentioned here in the text. The inner qualities are those qualities which you can take with you wherever you go. During the pandemic, post-pandemic, you're sleeping or, <laughs> or alive or in this life or future life with friends, without friends, they will be there to support you, to help you, to strengthen you. The external material, you know, facilities, and then also the families and friends, however good they are, it is again the bitter truth. There's no way they can be with you all the time, right? If you just, just turn the newspaper today and read that obituary part, you, know, you can see young, elderly, everybody dying. So that is, that is the bitter truth. So what we really need to do is cultivate these inner qualities and with the cultivation of this inner qualities, number one, we should learn to live in peace and happily every day, possible every hour, every minute, because this every minute, this this you know this minute and this hour that you are living, that is called life. That that is called life. And this reminds me a beautiful, beautiful, you know, shloka or verse. Uh, by Arya Deva in his 400 verses, where he says, whoever you are, the so-called living is only one moment. Whoever you are, the so-called living is just one moment. And people don't know this. Therefore, it is very difficult to find somebody who knows himself or herself. I think I know myself, you, you think you know yourself, but he says, no, you don't know yourself. I don't know myself. Because if you know yourself, then you should know 
that the so-called living is just one moment. So if you don't live that one moment properly, you are missing a part of your bigger life. So live happily, peacefully. Many of us are a little bit more privileged. We have the needed facilities, so there are many reasons to be happy. Even for others, comparing to the animals, or many other very, very fragile insects. We have many, many reasons to be, to be uh, happy. We are not able to appreciate that because we only think about the negativities, the problems, we keep on highlighting that. And the, that's why I say that problem is we see, we tend to see what we want to see, not what we should be seeing. There's the problem, we keep on seeing what we want to see, keep on hearing what we want to hear, not what we, you should be seeing, what should be hearing, that's the problem. But if you really see what you should be seeing and uh, uh, hear what you should be hearing, then you will see, you can, you can see many good things, you can hear many, many positive things, right? So therefore, to make a long story short, at the end of the day, whether you like it or not, whether you believe in religion or not, whatever is your you know, status and level of education and so forth, you will come to this conclusion, and I'm 100% sure about that, that at the end of the day, unless you take care of yourself, nobody can take care of you. And taking care of oneself means taking care of one's mind. Because it is the mind which decides your fate which tells you what to do, what not to do, where to go, where not to go. Each and every second and moment, the mind is dictating you. And unless you have the capacity to say no to the mind, when it tells you to go in the wrong direction, unless you know how to make proper decision, unless you know to make the proper choice, you will be led astray. Because there is more temptation to do the bad things. Anything that is destructive looks good superficially. I may not be correct, but sometimes I wonder, you know, the, the, the fact can be proved by if you see a poisonous plant. Many of the poisonous plants that I've seen, their flowers are especially beautiful. But if you run after that beautiful flower, you will also get the poison, right? So, the, so therefore, uh, it is really, really important. We are not just talking about doing Buddhist practice. Many of you may be Buddhist practitioners, then of course you have to do it. Otherwise also taking care of the inner world, you know, that's why I'm happy that His Holiness' the second book, which is on mind, the first was on physics, Buddhist physics, the second was on primary law on Buddhist mind. So I, I hope you will take more care of that, right? And it is because of our not knowing ourselves and especially not knowing how the mind functions, how elusive they are, how powerful they are, how challenging they are, unless you understand these dimensions of mind. And simply said, unless you know how you deal with your emotions. Now, even in the West, now these days, they are talking so much about emotional regulation, you see. So we, we really need to be kind of uh, skilled and expert in how to uh, deal with the emotions and strengthen and cultivate the positive emotions and discourage and weaken and remove the negative emotions. Then your happiness will be there automatically. You don't have to talk much about it. It will be there automatically, right? So that's very, very important. Very, very important. Today I was reading some verses from Shanti Devas Bodhicharya Avatara. I was planning to publish a book, Bodhicharya Avatara, His Holiness Commentary in Tibetan, which we published before and it ran out. So I was again reviewing it and I came across a line which says that if you, so long as you t cultivate this loving kindness and uh, wisdom, understanding, emptiness, you will be happy automatically. And then the, the smile on your face will come automatically and the grimaces, you know, 
uh, that you carry on your face will disappear automatically, right? The smile on your face is not there. Grimaces are more on your face because you, you just think about the negativities and you maintain short-sightedness, narrow-mindedness, and the end result is, and then think just about oneself, then the end result is you don't get what you want. Despite a lot of material accumulation, you feel lonely, unhappy, you know, <laughs> things like that, right? So from our point of view, we can, we can, you know, we can, we can, we can wonder and think how Miladeva was happy in an empty cave. How can he be happy, right? So that clearly shows that it is possible once you change your mental outlook. And I remember a statement by Buddha who said, I'm happy because I have nothing. Look, just, just look at the statement, you see? We will be crying and shouting and saying that I'm so unhappy because I have nothing. But Buddha says, I'm happy because I have nothing, <laughs> right? So therefore, what I'm saying is, not asking you again to become beggar overnight, but what I'm saying is the importance of cultivating these inner qualities. So in the case of cultivating these inner qualities, uh, the discussion of this chapter was happened in uh, a place called Nithang when uh, Atisha was uh, uh, staying with uh, Dom Tamba. Uh, and then during the discussion, they, they, they uh, broached this subject. And then, then during this discussion, they said, this is the time now that we should search and find the wealth of the superior beings. We should now find and discover the wealth of the superior beings. So if you look after and search the wealth of the superior beings, it is really like finding the, 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 the whole year's sustenance just by working for, working for one month. In other words, if you cultivate this inner qualities of a superior being, you will get that complete sustenance for many future lives. Just by working hard today and cultivating these inner qualities, you will get the nourishment and sustenance for many lives to come. So that's why he's saying that it's really like working for one month and then not, not have to work for the rest of the year. Right? And he, he especially says, that this is the time we must make our life meaningful and fulfill the, the purpose of our being born in a central land. Being born in a central land means being born in a place where the Buddha's teaching is available. Now, in order to help you cultivate these inequalities, and lessen your attachment to the material objects. He says that day and night you meditate on impermanence, which makes perfect sense. And we, when we have no inkling or no idea of how ephemeral our life is, day in and day out our life is ebbing out once you understand this fragility of human life, once you understand that I'm not sure whether I will live tomorrow or not, then your endless pursuit to material accumulation will come to an end. It's not saying that you will stop eating or things like that, but this, this, this especially this unnecessary greed that we have will come to an end. So in this text, he uses the word illusion, illusion for wealth. 
the Tibetan word for wealth itself is very, very uh, meaningful because we use the word Sangzing. So literally translated, the Tibetan word Sangzing for wealth means something by whose achievement people will run wild and there will be a lot of you know, hustle and bustle and a lot of commotion, which is absolutely true. It is in the pursuit of these material objects, people are just running like anything. And it is in relation to getting these material objects, people kill each other, people fight each other, wars are fought between countries and things like that. So it makes us uh, completely you know, run wild. So therefore it is important to know that this, this, this wealth after which we are running so much is really like an illusion, is ephemeral and it has not much essence because today you may have some wealth, tomorrow you may be a beggar. Things change anytime, just, just as we are, many of us are experiencing today. We did not expect this pandemic to come and suddenly it came and many people lost a job and many are still struggling. And ordinarily says, normally what we do is the practice known as exchanging one's own wealth, butter, butter or exchange. You sell your wealth to others and then make profit and you know get something from others, things like this. And when you engage in such marketing and uh, buttering and exchange, then this will make you run. This will make you very, very busy as we are saying today. I mean, this teaching is given so many years back and which we are actually doing today. Everybody is running, as I said earlier, running for what? For material accumulation. And we run because we want happiness. We run in all the directions in search of happiness. But Atisha says, so long as you, you, you don't have contentment, you will not be satisfied and you will do more running and that will in fact increase your suffering. And this is like putting a spark of fire at the, the, at the start of a forest or something. When you put a spark in the forest, it will become a wild fire, right? So therefore, before you produce this forest fire by that spark, that spark of desire must be stopped, must be lessened right in the beginning. Otherwise, the whole forest will be burnt by that fire of desire. Wealth, from one point of view, he says, is really, as I said, interestingly, I already mentioned that, but it is here in the text. He says it's, the, it's like the flower of a poisonous plant, poisonous tree. Because when you see this beautiful flower on a poisonous plant, then the innocent children, they would just go to get that flower. And by doing that, they are touching poison and they, are, they, are, they may lose their life. So it is wealth that destroys most of us. By mistakenly, we think that this Wealth, material accumulations are the source of long-lasting happiness. So this greed, this relentless desire comes from the, the root, which is the self-grasping. And because of this self-grasping, you deserve that desire. Because of this desire, you run towards that object of attachment. And through that way, your long-term purpose is defeated. So therefore, instead of running after this internal, external wealth, you should now change the course of your, uh, course of direction of your running, now run inwards, go insides, take refuge to Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, and then, first of all, develop faith to them. That is out of, so here when we talk about internal wealth, he talks about seven internal wealth. 
So the first is develop that faith towards Buddha Dharma Sangha. Buddha is somebody who is completely enlightened and Dharma is his teaching. Sangha are those people who engage in uh, the practice of the teaching. So develop faith towards them because faith is really like a huge ground which will support all your virtuous practices. With faith, you develop humility, you develop respect, and then gradually it will induce enlightenment. So therefore see that faith as a source of many, many great qualities. People who are without faith, it is impossible or very difficult for them to cultivate any good virtuous qualities. Just like a burnt seed cannot produce sprouts or green saplings. It is by faith that you are able to follow the instructions of the teaching. So Buddha and other higher beings, great beings. So that is number one. And I've explained a little bit earlier also with faith, there are basically many, many different types of faith, but faith here also means uh, the three, which is clear faith, which means your, must, your mind must be free from any kind of turbidity of negative emotions. It should be completely clear and open, and then you become receptive. So that faith towards the the objects of refuge is very, very important. It makes you receptive. Then trusting faith, by knowing the qualities of the object of refuge, you should wholeheartedly trust, just like a innocent small child trusting his or her mother. And then aspiring faith, that means you should yourself aspire to change and become the Buddha, the objects of refuge. Right, that is that in order to get the highest happiness and remove suffering and especially help others, you should yourself actualize that state of Buddhahood. It's very, very important. That's number one wealth. Number second is morality. Morality is like the big ground where all the crops are grown, all the seeds can be planted. And morality is really like water that washes the stains or negative deeds. When you have observed this pure practice of morality, Then as I said earlier, you are preparing that clear ground for cultivating all other qualities like concentration, meditative stabilization and so forth. People who practice morality, they naturally shine out in the human crowd without your having to intimidate or threaten others. People will come to you and bow down to you with full respect and obeisance as people are doing to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Not to a dictatorial leader, even with the use of the gun, right? So that is the great quality of morality. Simply said, morality basically means helping others as much as you can, that is morality because it's a good proper practice. So morality in Buddhism is not observing a discipline imposed upon you by someone that has the authority. So morality number one means restraining from negative deeds. But that is not enough. So the second category of morality is collecting the virtuous deeds, virtuous qualities. That is the second level of practice of morality. This is good enough, but not enough. 
So the third morality is helping and benefiting others. The reason that you remove the negative deeds, restrain the negative deeds, and cultivate the positive qualities is to help not just yourself, but help all other sentient beings. So you can read in very simple, understandable, you know, language if you want to read about these three in His Holiness's book, Ethics for the New Millennium. Not, not in a Buddhist term or language, but a language that you can easily understand. So read more about that. So that is the second wealth. Third is practice of generosity or giving. Giving means giving your flesh, if possible. Of course, we have not reached that state, but if possible, even giving up your body or all your possessions. Because the more you give, the more you're accumulating that merit to, to be rich, if that is at the end of the day, if that is what you want. To become rich is not just accumulating more, but just giving more. Very interestingly, the scientifically, some, some scientists, they did a test about this, whether the givers are more happy or the receivers are more happy. And through this test, they found that the givers are more happy than the, receivers, than the receivers. So this is so interesting, you know. So you need to start doing that, practice that, and you will understand why this is so. Because it is, you know, in the spirit of human nature to share. But sometimes because of the societal circumstances, environment, we don't do this. But if you really start practicing a little bit and giving at least to start with giving those things which you don't have much use, because we have so many things we have accumulated, which we are not using, at least start giving those things, which will actually clean your house. And also you can benefit many others. And for the benefit of many others who, who have not heard about this, I'm, I'm sharing this example of a Kadamba master, who was also an ordinary person like you and me, and who was also in the beginning, he was so miser and so spent tripped and he realized that, that this is a big draw big. And he decided to practice giving, but he could not dare to give anything to others. So what he did was he picked up something in the right hand and gave it to the left hand, his own right hand to the left hand. Then he picked up something on the left hand and gave it to the right hand. And after repeatedly doing this, then gradually he learned to give and share to others. And once you give something to others and see the smile on the face of others, you will be so thrilled, you will be so happy, you know, then you will, you will feel, yes, I made somebody happy today. And you can easily do that. All of us can easily do that. So it may be sharing. You know, now, now the giving, giving means there's so many giving. Giving means not just material giving. Giving means giving fearlessness. That means if somebody is full of fear due to pandemic or other things, just go and meet that person and talk to that person. That person may be only, you know, getting all the fearful side of the COVID and not the cheerful side of the coming of the vaccine and other things, you know. So share those side of the story, right? And sing a song together and enjoy a nice food together. There's so many things we can do. We are, we are so-called clever human beings. So we, we should use this clever human mind for many constructive things and the day and the night will go like this. And uh, with the passage of time, the con this, this pandemic will also be over, you see. So we can change it. So giving fearlessness and then giving Dharma teaching, just as I'm supposed to be doing here. So Dharma teaching, not just Buddhist teaching, but share your expertise, your education, 
Maybe it's a computer skill, maybe it's a mathematical skill, whatever skills that, that can help uplift the life of that person, share it. So there's so many, so many things that you can give. And then also giving service, giving service. So many things that you can give. And make sure that when you practice giving, give those things which is going to help others, not harm others. So therefore giving poison is discouraged. Giving knife is also not very good. Not forbidden, but not very good, right? So give something that will, that in my case, I, I'm not saying I'm a you know, big practitioner, practitioner, but what I'm saying is occasionally I, I give torch to others, small flashlights, you know, which might save other people, help save other people's life, you see, torch or a nice book or pen, something to write, something that will help them increase their wisdom. You know, if you look at the story of uh, Shariputra, the foremost, one of the foremost disciple of Buddha, he's said to be the, the, the person with the supreme intelligence. And it is said that he got this supreme intelligence because in his past lives, he distributed needle with thread to sew the broken cloth of other people. So, so, the, so from this, what we are saying is, give those which will mend what is broken, which will mend what is broken. It's a beautiful idea. So like that. So giving. Then the next is, literally translated, the next is, listening or hearing, but I suppose this can be better translated if I call it study. Those of you, have, you who have attended His Holiness' recent teaching, even otherwise in many of His Holiness' teachings, His Holiness is repeatedly saying, study, study, study. So therefore, it is by studying, it is by listening that you will be able to know the Dharma. It's by listening to the teaching that you will be able to give up negative deeds. It is by listening to the teaching that you will give up many meaningless activities that you are doing, many, less, meaning, many meaningless ways of life that you're leading. You might be able to give up that. And it is listening that your ignorance can be dispelled. Right? And the listening or study is such a wonderful thing the once you get that knowledge through listening or through study, then it's the inner wealth that you have acquired, which no thieves can steal, no robbers can rob, and it, it will also not become an excessive baggage. Otherwise, when we keep on accumulating and hoarding many of these material objects, then they become excessive baggage, even while we are alive. And at the time of the death, of course, they're all excessive useless baggage. We'll have to leave everything behind. But even before death, even when we travel, if you carry too much, then this, this, the airlines, they permit maybe 15 clothes or 20 clothes. And more than that, if you carry it, then they will tell you, Madam, sorry, you have to pay for the excessive baggage. <laughs> So I have been telling people that Buddha told this long time before, don't carry excessive baggage. And nobody listened. Now, they, you, are, now you are charged at the airport and in many places for carrying excessive baggage and you will be fined heavily at the time of the death if you have excessive baggage, right? So therefore, while you have the capacity, while you have the opportunity, it is really, really important to share, to share what you have. I remember one of, the, one of the teachers saying that I'm not going to talk much about the benefit of giving, but I'll tell you about the disadvantages of hoarding, disadvantages of grasping. You see, it's not only not good for others, it's not good for you also. Now in many big countries, hoarding has become a huge problem especially during pandemic and other difficult times, some of the business people, in order to raise the price, they hoard. 
And then they do what, what is known as the black marketing and things like that, which is horrible. So therefore, hoarding is not good. Hoarding is not good. Ordinarily, you feel that you are rich and you have too many things, but the more you have, the more you will get problem. Nothing comes value free. Nothing comes value free. So remember this, remember this. So therefore, that is the, uh, uh, next wealth and the next wealth is having a sense, having a sense of shame having a sense of shame <coughs> having a sense of shame means taking yourself as a as an example saying for example i can't do this by because i'm a monk i can't do this or uh, I am a Buddhist, I can't do this. So using yourself as a reason and uh, stop doing destructive negative things, then that is called observing the discipline, observing the practice with a sense of shame. And then the next is called sense of now, this is very difficult to translate. I've seen so many English words used for this, but I don't know which one is the best. I can't say. For example, some people use the word conscience. Some people use the word modesty. Some use the word decency, some use the word humility. So this Tibetan word tell you, tell you, which basically is different from the sense of shame here, tell you basically means you stop doing certain destructive negative activities because of concern for others. Because of concern for others, not your, yourself as a reason, but to take others as a reason. If I do this, what my parents will think. If I do this, what others feel, you know, with this concern for others, you stop negative deeds. That is called uh, tell you about, or having kind of uh, uh, conscience or concern for others. I remember clearly Nagarjuna. I think Ratnavali or somewhere he mentions that the world is sustained by two things, when people have a sense of shame and people have a consideration for others, then the world can be looked after, world can be sustained. If people have no sense of shame, no concern for others, unfortunately, many, not only ordinary people, many so-called leaders I mean, it's something you can see on the TV, TV screen, you know. No hesitation telling lie or bullying and exploitation. And unbelievable. So this is happening, you see. So therefore, if we want to maintain the world in its total purity, then sense of shame and consideration for the others is extremely, extremely important. So these are the seven internal wealth. I briefly explained it. And if you want to know more, you need to do more research and study more about this. And what is most important is not just getting an idea or knowledge about these things, but make it a part of your wealth, inner wealth. As a result of today's study, you should at least remember these seven wealth of the superior beings. You should write it down somewhere and call them my inner wealth and enrich those internal wealth by knowing more about them by cultivating them, 
by making it a part of your life. As somewhere one Buddhist teacher says, if you sincerely practice this, then you will definitely see a positive result. Because whatever the Buddha has taught is non-deceiving, is non-deceiving. Right? Of course, there are so many other internal wealth we must cultivate, but here especially, he mentions these uh, seven internal wealth, and he emphasizes the point by saying that since these are the supreme wealth of a superior being, you should always try to nurture them and make sure, sorry, the, the last one I forgot. The, the last wealth is the wealth of wisdom. Wealth of wisdom. Because if you have this wealth of wisdom, now wealth of wisdom, wisdom is of many types, wisdom, understanding, impermanence, dependent origination, shunyata, and so forth. As you will recall, that earlier we spoke about bodhicitta, compassion, loving kindness, which is the side of the heart, we call it uh, the skillful method. And if you develop the wisdom understanding the way things are with the development of the heart, the bodhicitta, then these two, the development of bodhicitta and the development of wisdom understanding emptiness, these two are like the two wings of the bird. Just as the bird is able to soar in the space with the two wings of the bird, likewise, with the cultivation of these two most important inner qualities, we'll be, we will be able to fly into the space of uh, enlightenment. And he finally says that this kind of cultivation of seven inner qualities are not easily done by many people. And especially these qualities cannot be cultivated if you're born into a negative state of existence. So that is to say that now is the time the occasions for developing such inner qualities will not come all the time in all, in all lives. So therefore, cultivate these supreme inner qualities. And if you develop this wholeheartedly, sincerely, you will become an object of offering, object of respect by the deities and by the human beings. Isn't this amazing? So this completes the eighth chapter on the seven wealth of the superior beings. Okay, so we stop here today. Some questions? Hello, everyone. Please ask your questions. You can raise your hands as usual. Or if you're extremely uncomfortable, you can just write your questions in the chat box. Yeah. Okay, Jackie, you can go ahead. I'll send you a um, send you an unmute request. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I was wondering, you mentioned Arya Davis' 400 verses in the living is only in one moment, and it's hard to know yourself because you don't. Can you expand on what he meant by knowing yourself? Hmm? I'm sorry? Oh. Not clear. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Um, yeah, yeah. Ar Aria Davis, 400 verses, you mentioned living in the moment, and therefore we don't do that so we don't know ourselves. Can mm. you expand on what he meant by know yourself? Is that just because you're not experiencing each moment that you don't know yourself? Or yeah, yeah, you yeah. Don't, or you don't know yourself, like, I don't know that I'm, you know, arrogant or something because... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so... When we, when we talk about the self or the person, it is just a stream of continuity of many moments. So therefore, if you don't know one moment, it is equal to not knowing yourself. So therefore, he's saying that ordinarily we think when we, to our unquestioning mind, when we talk about somebody, or especially when you think about yourself, 
we tend to think that I am somewhere here where I can lay my hands on and touch it to our ordinary unquestioning mind. When you're questioning, it's a little bit better, but ordinarily we hardly question in our day-to-day -day running, you know, busy life. We hardly question. Do you think I'm running, I'm eating, you know, I'm here, fine. You know, you take it for granted. You, you see yourself as something concrete and solid and which can, which can fight somebody, which can face the challenges or things like that. You see it's something concrete. But then if you search it, your body is not yourself, obviously. And your mind is more closer to the self, but that mind is also not yourself. A clear indication is that normally we say, my mind is not happy, my body is aching or so forth. So clearly showing that this body, your body and your mind is what you possess, what you own. So the owner and what is being owned has to be different. So that is to say the owner or the self is different from the body and the mind. But again, if you want to just lay your hands upon and say, this is I, it is not possible to do that. It's just, just you know, conglomeration or heap of many moments, many situations, many experiences, many events. So therefore you need to understand each and every moment to understand the self, to understand the life, okay? Next we have Natasha. Natasha, can you please unmute yourself? Gishela? Yes. Good afternoon, Gishela. Very glad to see you. I have, uh, as usual, questions from uh, YouTube, from our Russian listeners. And uh, I just would like to let you know that we have three questions. Okay. Uh, so please let me, Norzin, please let me know if I may ask all of them. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, okay, so the first question from Dinara. Uh, she asks, um, I heard uh, two points of view. Uh, the first one, to begin practice, you, need, uh, you don't need understanding uh, emptiness because Tantra has its own methods of realizing emptiness. And the second point of view is that both are required because any practice begins from the emptiness. Mm. So what is correct? No, practice, when you talk about practice, is a, you're talking about a vast subject. It can be just practice of compassion, and no emptiness at all. That is also practice. It can be practice of patience. It can be practice of giving. It can be practice of loving kindness. There's so many practices. They're all practices. So you cannot say without emptiness, you can't practice, right? And you cannot say that, and also it is wrong to say that in Tantra, you know, practice of emptiness is not necessary. And in fact, in Tantric practice, emptiness is a must without which you can't visualize yourself as a deity. One very important factor that is used or statement that is used when you visualize yourself transformed into deity, we recite this famous Sanskrit lines, Om So Bhava Shud, Sarva Dharma So Bhava Shud, which means, which is basically saying, Om So Bhava Shud, Om refers to the person. Om is a combination of three letters, A, O, Ma, which symbolizes the body, speech, and mind, which means person. So Om So Bhava Shud means the person is by nature pure. That means devoid of independent existence. And just like the person, Sarva Dharma So Bhava Shud, meaning just like the person, all phenomena are devoid of inherent existence. They are pure by nature. So through this way, when you think and uh, meditate on this emptiness of the person and all phenomena, then you dissolve your perception of ordinariness. And from that state of devoid of ordinary perception, you arise yourself into a deity. So without that understanding of Shunyata, there's no way you can visualize yourself as a deity. And I remember very well his holiness saying, if you don't have this understanding of Shunyata, there's no point, no fun, just visualizing a yellow deity or red deity sitting somewhere. You know, it's not saying that suddenly you visualize a red deity sitting there or a, a deity with 1,000 arms sitting there. He only says that's make, that makes no sense at all. So, this, so that is a must. 
Okay. Right. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Gishila. And uh, the, the second question is, um, a person is asking, one night in a dream, I saw lamas and gods in the form of black demons. Mm -hmm. And afterward, I fell sick, ill. Were they poisons of the mind? The question is. Mm. So normally in Buddhism, we say, don't pay too much attention to dreams. Not only when you're sleeping, even when you're awake, you're experiencing another form of dream. So that's why in Buddhist practice, we say, see everything like an illusion. Even when you're awake, like a dream means not paying much attention, like an illusion, like a dream, not paying much attention. Don't grasp, don't see them as having inherent existence. So similarly in the dream, number one, what you dream, you have no control. And dream is based on my own personal experience. Dream is a very good storyteller. It makes its own story. I'll tell you a story, very interesting story. You will all now be very happy with this story. You will all love and smile. Because I escaped Tibet when I was very young. And uh, two occasions I've seen the Chinese army chasing us. I was uh, just a little boy. So that must have left a very strong imprint in my mind. So occasionally I get these dreams of being chased by Chinese army and things like that. So one night I got this dream that I was moving at the foothill of a mountain. Then suddenly I see this thousands of Chinese armies in uniform coming from the top of the mountain down. And I was only myself. And the place where I was moving was full of, you know, slates, you know, rocky and slates. So I was actually running, you know, the Chinese army was overwhelming, I was running, but I had a gun, you know, uh, the, 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 the country country kind of style of gun, I was carrying it. And then, then somebody fired from the Chinese army and the bullet hit on my, I think, right or left side. And I was, you know, the blood coming out. So I had one of my hand holding that you know, closing that blood and another hand holding that gun and moving. And I could, could hear the slits, you know, slipping under my feet and things like that. So I was so scared that because of that, this fear, I suddenly woke up. Now the story, when I woke up, what I found to my great, great astonishment was that there's a small something like, I don't know, whatever it is, something was like, uh, hurting me on, on, the, on the side where I thought the Chinese army <laughs> hit a bullet, you see? So, so that's why I'm saying the dreams are very good storytellers. So don't pay much attention to the dreams. And as I said, sometimes if, if you're a good practitioner, sometimes the demons try to disturb you and come in the form of a Buddha or a teacher and things like that is also possible. But whatever it is, dreams are dream. Don't pay too much attention. If you get a very good dream, go, Maybe good, feel happy, but don't get too excited. This is what we exactly do in our life. When you had, hear good news, it's good, but don't get too excited because bad news is waiting. When bad news is there, you will feel sad naturally, but don't feel too dejected because the next one is good news. So that is the experience that we have in dream and also in life, right? And then much of the dream that we get is either due to past life, or something that you did a few years back, or something that you did this morning. It leaves an imprint, especially if it is the, the, the what you did in uh, did was very impactful, then that, that imprint gets activated again. Okay. All right. Yes, Gishela. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, may I ask just the last question for today from our Russian audience? Right. It is short one. What's, what texts uh, do I need to read to cut out eight worldly dharmas? Eight worldly dharmas, you should really read the mind training texts. The, to, to, the easier text is a very good text that you should is 37 bodhisattva practices or seven points mind training or eight verses by Geshe Langdi Thangwa. These are excellent texts. Okay. 
Gishla, it looks like this is it for today's session, Gishla. So thank news. you so much. <laughs> <laughs> you can rest a little earlier today. Just kidding. I just wanted to say before we uh, wind up, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for people in India, that uh, today is the eve of Diwali, a uh, festival of light, uh, where uh, you know it celebrates uh, the victory of good over evil. And so, in these very challenging times. Uh, our Diwali greetings and prayers to all of you around the world and uh, certainly to uh, all our uh, Indian friends uh, who celebrate this. So uh, in these dark, difficult, challenging times, what ordinarily happens in Diwali is that we burn uh, lights and lamps and firecrackers. In Delhi, we're not burning firecrackers because there's so much pollution. And uh, this also welcomes for those of us who are sort of, you know, a little familiar with uh, uh, Hindu Indian mythology, the return of Lord Ram uh, from a long exile, uh, you know, back uh, to his rightful place. And so we call that Ram Rajya, which is the rule of virtue. So, you know, with a prayer that this may prevail in these dark times. And, uh, and we celebrate this particularly because uh, I think in the context of uh, uh, His, Holiness is the Dalai, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who so gloriously embraces uh, diversity, different faiths and religions, uh, and encourages us to learn from them. So in that spirit, uh, a very happy Diwali uh, from the Foundation and all of us. And we look forward uh, uh, to meeting again next Friday. Thank you very much, Keshala. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Gishila. Thank you, everyone. Happy Diwali. Light of your hearts. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you next week. <laughs>